In the city of Squamish, British Columbia, life and its busy comings and goings are nestled between the solid presence of time-worn mountains. A stunning landscape surrounds the small city, present in every aspect of daily life from work to play. Up and down this narrow strip of mountains, known as the Sea to Sky Corridor, communities such as Squamish and Brackendale are dynamic, colorful blotches of movement in the seemingly peaceful landscape they call home. But sometimes, it is easy to forget about our surroundings, even in places like the Sea to Sky Corridor. We pay less attention to the land we inhabit and more to the demands of everyday life. With these distractions in mind, life-altering hazards can go unnoticed, and potential perils can be overlooked. One of those perils looms just beyond Highway 99. It has the potential to demolish the highway, destroy parts of the city, and take the lives of those below. An 800-foot wall of rock, dubbed the Barrier, it holds back the waters of Lake Garibaldi. What is more, it is slowly falling apart. Can we lessen the risks of living below hazards like the Barrier? Yes, but only once we start to pay attention and seek to understand the land we live on. To do so, we can look at the way these hazards were formed. Over millions of years, mechanisms of nature slowly built up and chewed away at the mountains and valleys of the coast. The narrow hallway of the sea to sky is filled with well-known examples of the products of these processes. Whistler, Mount Garibaldi, the Chikai Fan, the Chief. Understanding their creation can give us the tools to understand lesser known, but no less important features such as the barrier. So what is the barrier and why should we care about this cliff that's crumbling? Well, there's a few reasons to care about this. One is it's, it's a very hazardous environment. The other is that it's just fascinating geologically. And it's a combination of many geologic factors that make the barrier come to be. And so we think of this as mountain building or tectonic activity. And that's where we have two plates, in this case an oceanic plate and a continental plate, coming together or converging. And then we have ice or, or glaciation. Those glaciers are going to build, those glaciers are going are to flow into the pre-existing valleys and deform the landscape, change the morphology of the landscape. Fire and ice is essentially the interaction of local volcanism with those pre-existing ice sheets. Sometimes the volcanoes erupt underneath the glaciers, sometimes adjacent to the glaciers, and these lava flows interact with the glacier, making interesting geological features. And then collapse is essentially erosion of these features. Some of them are, are unstable, so these materials are continually coming down from those mountains that were created by the tectonic activity into the big valleys that we have here along the coast mountains. The barrier began to form with the first of these processes when two of the Earth's plates started to crunch together. This collision forced the land into peaks thousands of meters tall, but occurred at a pace slower than the growth of fingernails. Over millennia, this process, known as plate tectonics, formed all coastal mountains. So our mountainous region is created through tectonic activity. 
And specifically here we have the Juan de Fuca plate to the west, which is an oceanic plate, and it's subducting or diving underneath the North American plate. It doesn't just dive underneath, however, it, it affects the overriding plate. As these converge, that material will fold and be more or less bowed up into a mountain range. And there's other factors that affect this mountain range. You might look at, at Mount Garibaldi. That's a volcano that's perched on top of those mountains created by this convergence. And as the Juan de Fuca plate subducts into the mantle, it's heated up and the mantle melts. And that mantle material can eventually make itself to the surface as, as liquid magma and erupt and form a volcano. So as we look around to other mountains, like take Whistler for an example. Well, there's sedimentary rocks on top of Whistler. So how did those get there? The subducting plates have brought this material and pasted it onto the edge of North America in a process called accretion. And so British Columbia is, is formed by a number of these terrains that are accreted onto the landscape. And so those terrains can include things like sediments from the ocean floor that are now up at very high elevations. Also, as we look around our landscape, we see, we see things like the Chief. And it's a rock that was, was crystallized, it was magma that was crystallized at approximately 20 kilometers depth in the Earth. And so a combination of tectonic uplift, coupled with erosion, stripping off the material above it, has brought that, that magma chamber to the surface as we see it now as the Chief. The Juan de Fuca plate continues to dive under the west coast of Canada. By building up the mountains, these processes also created the environment necessary for the formation of the barrier. There are more forces at work than plate tectonics, however. Beginning millions of years ago, the land was shaped by a finer, colder power, the power of ice. So in order to grow a glacier, you have to have it snow, and then the snow sh shall not melt the following summer. So some is left behind, then more snow falls, and more snow falls, and over time, um, the snow recrystallizes and becomes ice. Once ice reaches a certain pressure, it starts to move or deform plastically. Uh, if you have mountainous areas, of course, then they have relief, and then glaciers start to flow downhill into valleys. The Holocene period describes the last 10,000 years. During that period, glaciers advanced. Um, where we're sitting right now here, there was probably uh, 1.5 to 2 kilometers of ice. These glaciers, <clears throat> because they persisted for well over 10,000 years, sculpted the landscape quite dramatically. So it rounded ridges. And it also filled the valley bottoms with sediment, which otherwise would be really deep and V-shaped, but now they're really U-shaped because they're filled with sediments. And most of these sediments are of glacial origin. Although buried under ice, the sea to sky was not totally frozen. Fire still scorched the landscape. Understanding what can happen when volcanoes and glaciers interact is a crucial step to comprehending the barrier. Remnants of this meeting between molten rock and solid ice can be seen all over the Sea to Sky Corridor. So normally when you think of, of volcanism or a volcanic eruption, you think of a lava flow or an explosive eruption with a big, big ash cloud. When you're interacting with the glaciers, you're going to get different products. And sometimes you get things even like an alluvial fan that's related to the volcanism. One of these remnants lies beneath the wheels of our cars when we drive through Brackendale. Known as the Chikai Fan, this formation shares a common ancestry with the barrier. The uh, Chikai Fan is a large uh, alluvial fan landform in Squamish directly associated with uh, Mount Garibaldi, a uh, quaternary volcano here in Squamish, which is our major landmark as you drive into town. So the uh, Mount Garibaldi was an active volcano 14,000 years ago at the height of the last glaciation. And um, as the volcano, as lava flows were forming, they were, they were deposited and building out onto the uh, 
ice sheet that was coming down the Squamish and Chacamas rivers. And then at the end of the glaciation, say 13,000 to 12, 11,000 years ago, the ice sheet uh, thickness was uh, rapidly uh, diminishing and that was removing uh, support, toe slope support from the flanks of the volcano, causing uh, major collapses or rock avalanches. And um, as the ice pulled away and, and d continually uh, got thinner, uh, there were a series of terraces that formed up against the ice. And then finally the ice uh, completely pulled out of the valley and all this material was reworked and deposited into the valley floor, filling uh, what was at the time uh, House Sound Fjord, which extended much farther up valley. The Chikai Fan, which thousands of drivers pass over each day on the Sea to Sky Highway, is a modern day remnant of these processes. It's a giant pile of rocks and gravel that collapsed into the valley and rests there to this day. The story of Mount Garibaldi is an excellent example of the instability caused by interactions between molten rock and ice. Instability that the barrier shares. The giant fan of rock created from the volcano's collapse poses a threat to Squamish. A rock avalanche from the fan could dam nearby rivers, forming temporary lakes that could eventually unleash their waters onto Squamish and Brackendale below. So this geologic combination of events of tectonics, glaciation, and volcanism, or mountain building, ice, and fire and ice, lead to the circumstances under which the barrier can be formed. And now that barrier is at risk of collapse. In order to understand all this really neat, complex stuff, you just need to get out and look. Take a look around. It makes it real. With this, we now have all the pieces needed to understand the barrier's past and possible future. The subduction of one plate below another began forming mountain ranges tens of millions of years ago. Ice sheets blanketed the earth from this ancient age onwards in periodic ice ages. 11,000 years ago, glaciers collected in valleys. Eruptions from peaks in the volcanic belt sometimes interacted with the ice. Tectonic activity, glaciation, and volcanism were all crucial to the formation of the barrier. So the area where Garibaldi Lake currently is used to be a normal mountain valley. You had glaciers perched above it, they would melt, that meltwater would go downstream and fill into the, what is now the Squamish Valley. But now we go there and there's a big cliff. And that cliff is responsible for allowing Garibaldi Lake to be there. It's a lava flow and that lava flow actually came from Mount Price, which is up near the current Garibaldi Lake. And it came, it was going normally as a lava flow would down that pre existing valley. But we still had a big valley glacier at the bottom. And the barrier, normally a lava flow of its type, would be oh, maybe 10 meters thick. But this, because that lava flow came down the valley and butted up against that ice sheet, it over thickened. And now that it's between two and 300 meters thick. When the glacier then retreats, it's almost like a buttress. So somebody is holding you back and you're leaning forward and then that person walks away, you become unstable. And if you think about a major collapse, what might happen is the release of Garibaldi Lake down into the valley. Specifically for places like Brackendale, this is a, really a truly a hazard. Due to its instability and the consequence of total collapse, the barrier threatens the lives of those living below. Erosion is responsible for the barrier's slow destruction.
Erosion is really uh, each and every process that occurs on the Earth's surface and moves material downslope. So in the case of the barrier, this material is continually removed from the face of the cliff and it tumbles down into the valley below, forming a debris fan or a scree slope. This is more or less the giant pile of rock you see at the base of the barrier. All that material below the barrier was once a part of its face and it was built up by all these processes and now it's being broken down in an action called mass wasting where rock falls away from its original position and is gravitationally brought down to the valleys. So it's easier for this rock to fall if it's already loose and unstable. The atmosphere does this through weathering processes. One of these processes, known as frost wedging, we also call it frost shattering, really illustrates how such small things like drops of freezing water can tear apart gigantic features like the barrier. So if you have positive temperatures during the daytime, negative temperatures through the nighttime, water freezes at zero, then uh, it expands as it freezes, so it breaks open, open joints, and that's called frost shattering. To make matters worse, water from Lake Garibaldi is actually flowing out from under the natural dam created by the barrier. And it's continually undercutting it and possibly destabilizing it. Over time, these small processes can destabilize even giant walls of rock. Together, these factors threaten disaster for those who live in the shadow of the barrier. But, well equipped with the knowledge of its past and possible future, we can responsibly manage the potential collapse of this breathtaking but precarious geological feature. We have to expect that we're going to have disaster and have the means to, when the disasters happen, make people as safe as possible and to do things as respectfully as we can with regard to the environment. So in the District of Squamish, we have a phenomenal emergency program, probably one of the best in the province. We have a phenomenal uh, EOC, Emergency Operations Centre. There are also precautionary measures in place. So, of course, um, how you plan your city is really important when you live in such an environment that we live in and the geology that we have here. So really the, the hazard is how we as humans manage the landscape and manage our own growth. There are provincial regulations about where you can and can't build and if you deal, do build in certain areas you have to mitigate in a certain way so you either have to put up dikes or berms or some sort of deflection mechanism for debris and water um, and trees and all that sort of stuff. If we recognize that there's uh, certain levels of hazard and risk and we manage appropriately. It, it's our own actions that, that we have to fear. We can take up this responsibility by learning about the raw power of nature and how quickly it can take away life, but also how much it gives us. You, you don't question it because it's a reality. But it's brought us beautiful things, you know, that we have climbers um, scaling one of the most magnificent pieces of rock in the world, coming from all over the world to come here to do that. We've got one of the nicest and the best water resources around because we have a massive aquifer underneath um, a lava flow coming off Opal Cone that provides some of the best drinking water you could possibly imagine, a municipal drinking water. So we're, we're so lucky that we live here. And we live here because it's spectacular, because it has prosperity. When you're able to get out into the landscape around here and, and take a look and slow down and look around, use all your senses to observe what's going on, you start to see these subtle and beautiful lines of evidence for what happened here. The study of geology is kind of a detective story. You, you can read the landscape like you can read a book. So you, you head out into the bush on uh, sort of an everyday job and you're, you're seeing things, you're seeing layers, you're seeing deposits. And it really puts you in a, a different context for how do we as individuals fit into this landscape. How it got here, how long that took, and what might happen to it in the future. The barrier may collapse, but its presence has allowed the people that live below it to understand the massive, destructive, and yet hospitable power of the earth, and to find their own place within it. 
We have to have a respect for the environment around us. Not only a respect for the diversity and the health of the planet and those things, but respect for the geography, the geology, and the, and the potential for these massive events. The Squamish community has accepted this responsibility and has taken precautions against the hazards looming within the mountains of the sea to sky. This means understanding the dangers of the landscape and taking them into account while shaping our lives and communities. After being out there for a while, you start putting two and two together and piecing the puzzle together and piecing the story evolves. So you're telling the story of the land and that's what grabs me.